I'm Claire Beckman, and I'm the chairperson of the 2021 Virtual Shell Show, brought to you by the Sanibel Captiva Shell Club. I'd especially like to thank the committee that made this possible. In addition to myself, we have Mary Burton, Joyce Mathis, Phyllis Sharp, Joe Timko, Diane Thomas, and huge thanks to Connie Jump, who did most of the editing, all of the graphics, and we couldn't have done this without her. Thousands of folks made this happen. In addition to our over 50 sponsors who shelled out over 22,000 clams, we have videographers, still photo submitters, Shell Club members. We have subscribers to our website, our YouTube channel, people who follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We have loads of folks who have helped to make this possible, who even are in the videos. So we thank all of you and hope you enjoy the show. I am back as your cephalopod of ceremonies today, and I have some important housekeeping things to share with you. Tentacle one, you will not be able to pause the show and rejoin where you left off during the next two days, but you will be able to watch the show in its entirety on our website starting on Monday. That will be sanibelshellclub.com. And we hope you'll stay with us the next two days. Tentacle two, the schedule for both days is up on our website at sanibelshellclub.com. Tentacle three, and this is very important because three is how many hearts an octopus has. But tentacle three is there are three ways in which you may win one of our door prizes we will be awarding every single half hour during this show. Number one, you may comment under the video on YouTube in the chat section. Number two, you may make a comment via email at info at sanibelshellclub.com. And number three, you may go to our website at sanibelshellclub.com and make a comment. You need to do this every half hour or you will not be celebrating one of our great door prizes. Tentacle number four, use of any part of this broadcast without the written permission of the Sanibel Shell Club is prohibited. So drop us a line and we'd love to allow you to use this over and over again. Tentacle number five, very important. You will be voting on the People's Choice Award for the best photograph submitted from hundreds in the show. You will get a chance to vote on one out of seven. All seven finalists have been selected. The seven finalists are the winners in each of the seven categories. There will be a time during the show where you will be selecting the People's Choice Award. And again, there are three ways to select the People's Choice Award. Comment on YouTube, email us at info at sanibelshellclub.com or complete the form on our website for the photo contest by going to sanibelshellclub.com. Tentacle 6. The Sanibel Shell Show will be back at the Community House next year in March of 2022 and be its wonderful, usual, judged, competitive show. But this year, we have no t-shirt sales, no book sales, no shell sales, no gate admission. But we know you're having a good time, so we would love it if you would go to our website at sanibelshellclub.com. So hit the button that says donate, and all of the proceeds from that will be used for our grant program. Thank you. Tentacle 7. This is very important. We are amateurs. We did not pay anyone to put together these videos, to write them, to direct them, to edit them, or even to put this show on today. We are volunteer amateurs. So we think it's going to go very well. But if there's an electrical storm in Indiana or something blows up in Colorado, we could have a problem, Houston. So make sure if we have a problem, you go to our website on Monday where you will be able to see the show in its entirety. 
And last but not least, tentacle number eight. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate your being here. Let's let the celebration of all things mollusk begin. The first Sanibel Community Fair was held on the porch of the Matthews House, now the Island Inn, in 1912 and was a miniature county fair with baked goods, fancy needlework, and homemade gifts offered for sale by the ladies of Sanibel to help the community. A few years later, Hallie Matthews invited her guests to show their self-collected shells in the parlor and porch of the inn, and the Sanibel Shell Fair was started. Displayed shells had so much appeal that the next year, the Shell Fair was held on the porch of the Sisters Inn, later called Casa Ibel Hotel. Every year, more shell displays were added and people began to arrive by ferry from Fort Myers to see them. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford were among the more distinguished visitors at the early Shell Fairs. Because the Shell Fair had grown in size and popularity, the men of Sanibel got together and built the existing community house in 1927 to hold the now annual event. The main hall of the community house was always decorated with shells and sea life just for people to show their beautiful collections of Sanibel shells. The March 1936 issue of the Islander newspaper reported that the Sanibel Shell Fair made a profit of $150 and that was used for making repairs on the community house. This was the first time that the Shell Fair ran over a three-day period and all the booths were sold out well in advance. The ladies just weren't prepared for all the publicity they received from newspapers all over Florida. In the 1937 Islander, the Shell Show was again reported to be most successful. An estimated 1,000 people saw the show. One of the organizers said, quote, we couldn't count all of them. The Sanibel Shell Fair kept running, even through the Depression years, thanks in part to Dr. Louise Perry, a longtime winter resident of Sanibel and a distinguished malacologist. She helped keep the Shell Fair running while so many other Florida Shell shows had to close down. In 1941, when war clouds were gathering over America, the Sanibel Shell Fair was postponed for several years. After the 1944 hurricane that did so much damage to the entire island, including the community house, many records were lost, and a new charter was formed allowing for a competition show. The first ribbons were thought to be exclusively for children, but this is not known for certain. Later, ribbons were awarded for Sanibel and Captiva shells and were judged mostly for their beauty. In 1961, the Sanibel Captiva Shell Club was formed with 27 members. That same year, the Shell Fair Committee of the Sanibel Civic Association asked our new club to work out a set of rules and classes for the exhibits for the next fair. There were 67 scientific exhibits that year, and by the 1963 Sanibel Shell Fair, that number doubled to 140 scientific exhibits and two judges. By the 1960s, collecting live mollusks to kill for their shells was coming under scrutiny. The Shell Club created posters to educate the public against wholesale live shelling, one with this catchy phrase, take all the dead shells you can carry, but leave the live ones to marry. In January of 1962, the first shell count was held. On one specific morning, you could shell anywhere on either island and then bring your findings to a hot coffee and donuts location to record what you found. 70 men and women braved the chill of early morning to bring in 128 species. Every genonia found on our beaches was supposed to be registered with the Shell Club. Today, the annual Sanibel Shell Festival is a combination of outdoor shell fair hosted by Sanibel Community House and shell crafters with shells and shell craft sales, food, and a raffle. And inside the community house, the shell show is hosted by the Sanibel Captiva Shell Club with judged scientific and artistic exhibits. Always held the first Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in March, the Sanibel Shell Show is an international event 
touted as being the longest running and most prestigious shell show in the USA. Watch our sister video on an overview of the Sanibel Shell Show and Festival for a glimpse of a normal shell show from recent years, because the 2021 shell show was anything but normal. Instead of canceling the 2021 Sanibel Shell Show altogether due to the COVID-19 pandemic that caused all large gatherings to be canceled, the Shell Club decided to hold a virtual show on our club's YouTube channel. Videos on shell art, science, mollusk research, fun DIY shell projects, museums, and so much more. The membership and public response to our shell photo contest, Sanibel Stoop, and your favorite shell slideshows resulted in 424 photo submissions from 15 countries around the world. And thanks to 50 plus generous sponsors, our 2021 Educational and Research Grants program will continue through these difficult times. As of March 2021, our Shell Club has approximately 400 members and we're still growing. Visit our website, SantaBellShellClub.com, to join our fun group and get involved with the Sanibel Shell Show yourself.
having me. My name is Rebecca Mensch. I work at the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. And over the past few years, we have been doing some work on live genonias. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you today. Genonia is a pool gastropod shell. It can get up to three or four inches long. It is arguably Sanibel's top shell. For a lot of people that are here shellings, the genonia is the holy grail of shelling. So over the past few years, we've started to include a lot more information about the live animals that grow shells rather than just talking about the shells. During that process, we found that there really just aren't any photos or videos of live genonias. So we started this mission to find some live genonia that we could photograph. They live offshore. So in order to find them, we had to take along on a research crew. Enter Dr. Gregory Herbert. Dr. Herbert is an associate professor at USF Tampa. Over the past decade, he has been mapping mollusk communities on the Florida Gulf Shell. We really don't know what is out there and where they are. He was able to bring me along as a guest scientist. He also brings along a lot of students. What his methods are is dropping down a dredge box, it very methodically of points and, and how long it's there, and then brings everything up and checks for what is a mollusk. So he had agreed that if we found any live genonias, he would loan them to the museum for, for us to do research. We were very lucky that first cruise, which was in February of 2018, we did find live genonias. We were able to get some really cool photographs of these animals, and that was just our baseline goal. So we accomplished that goal, but we very quickly found other things that were very curious and that we wanted to learn about. We got this profile shot that was really the photo that we wanted, um, but we also got some other cool photos. Here's one trying to crawl up and over a rock. Here's one climbing up the side of a small enclosure, so you can see how big its foot can really stretch out. You can see this is the, the head here with these tentacles. There's a siphon. Here's this big outstretched foot. This is a close-up of the head of the animal. Here's the siphon. This is a little protection, it, it, but it makes it look like it's wearing a little baseball cap. Here's one eye, here's another eye. Ring. They have these tentacles that stick off the side of the head that make it look like it's wearing a little mustache. So they have this cute, obvious face. We also had an opportunity to learn more about the day-to-day -day life of the Genonias. And what we found is that they like to eat lettered olives. And you'll see here, tap, tap, tap. And then the proboscis comes out, which has the mouth at the end of it. And then you see this really sudden uh, response, this weird kind of milky cloud that comes out. I had created this feeding box. There's water flow, but nobody can get in or out. So we had been finding empty lettered olive shells in the system, but you can't prove 100% that it's the Jonias eating them. You know, it could be that the lettered olives are eating each other, or maybe it's they're dying for another reason. So we wanted to really get proof that it was the Jononias eating the lettered olive. So we set up this box and we were able to capture this video. I opened up the feeding box and checked on the lettered olive and there was absolutely no response to touch. So I had assumed that the animal was dead. I removed the other lettered olives and put that one lettered olive and the one genonia back into that feeding box. And about 15 minutes later, the lettered olive unfurled its foot and went back on again. So it was what I thought was dead was actually some sort of immobilized for about 15 minutes. And then for lack of a better term, woke up again and went back on with its day. At that point, I just left the two animals in that feeding enclosure. And when I came back the next morning, we had one live genonia and one empty lettered olive shell. So that was really the confirmation we were looking for that yes, the genonias are eating the lettered olives, but like most good science in that process, it created all these other questions for us. You know, what exactly is going on here? What's this milky stuff coming out? So this video was actually published by myself and Dr. Liao in early 2019. So if you're interested in seeing this video at any other time, or if you wanted to read a little bit more about what's going on, you can go on to researchgate.net, which is a free website. So one of the things that we were looking into in the past was how do we publicly display these animals? What's the feeding like? How often do they need to be fed? What's the care or the husbandry like? And I'm happy to say that these large male adult genonias are on display in our new living gallery beyond shells. Um, so if you come visit the museum, you'll be able to see these um, on our ground floor new exhibits. We found that they really only like live gastropods and that they're even kind of picky about which species of gastropods that, that they're eating. But they tend to average about one live lettered olive per week. 
For husbandry, we found that their lighting actually really isn't an issue. The bigger thing that is necessary is they need to be able to, to bury their soft parts of their body. They need to be able to have what we assume is a feeling of protection. When we've tried just in, in short term, in a system without any substrate, so no sand or anything, and it's just exposed glass, they tend to continuously circle around looking for some place to bury into. And then when you change them to a different habitat that has that substrate, the sand or gravel or whatever, they immediately just dig down into it. It seems like they spend most of their time kind of buried and protecting themselves, which is something that's very similar to their prey, the lettered olives. That's what they spend most of their time doing as well. And as always, we have more questions. That video of the incapacitation of the lettered olive just raised so many cool questions. What exactly is going on there? Is it venom? At this point, we don't really have enough information to 100% scientifically call that venom. How are they then consuming the animal? This is a picture of a genonia with its foot engulfing a lettered olive that it is eating. And there's this weird kind of toxic green looking film. Is that something coming out of the lettered olive? Is that something that the genonia is excreting? Is it just digested stuff? Really, what is going on here with the actual consumption, the ingestion of the lettered olive as food. Something that I'm really looking forward to would be the reproduction of these animals. We have not found any descriptions of genonia egg cases or what they look like as soon as they hatch. By looking at the shells of the adult animals and looking at the protoconch, it looks like the animals probably hatch out as very, very large um, hatchlings but we don't know. Our two large genonias that we have on display are both males, which we can confirm through visual exam. The males have different reproductive organs than the females do. So we are hoping that sometime in the future, we'll be able to collect an adult female and that we might be able to have some reproduction happen. And the other thing is growth. We've seen growth out of both of the genonias that we've had, but it's been very different. They're both about the same size. They're both males. They've been in the same systems throughout their entire time with us, but they've grown very different. This one, you can see here, it's maybe a quarter of an inch of growth. Our other one has almost a, an entire inch of new growth. And we can't really account for why there would be that discrepancy in growth when they've had all of the same parameters. So still a lot of questions about the growth of these animals and how frequent are the growth spurts and all of that. This is a rear view of a genonia saying so long and crawling away from us. And this is the protoconch here, this very beginning of the shell. But I just wanted to say thank you for joining. Thank you to uh, Dr. Herbert and FSU for uh, loaning us these animals and letting us participate in their in their research and their cruises. And of course, thank you to the Shell Club. They've always been huge supporters of us. We really appreciate everything that they do and, and the huge undertaking of making sure that this still happens this year, even in a different format. So we really appreciate everything that they've done. And hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. If you're on Sanibel, feel free to come stop by the museum and check out our live Genonias for yourself.
Welcome, I'm Suzanne Marie Deitch and I love fussing over tiny shells and sea life to create Sailor's Valentine mosaic shell art. We live in what is affectionately known as flyover country. Far from the beaches of Florida, on an island of trees surrounded by oceans of farm fields. With my husband, we enjoy sharing the changing seasons with family and grandchildren on this 22 acres of paradise. This is my happy place to balance the overwhelming stresses and many family health challenges. Some read, do puzzles, and some are lucky enough to walk the beaches. And much to the skepticism of my family, I choose to fuss over the treasures from the ocean. For me, it began in 2006. While reading about a sailor's life, I came across the description of a curious little treasure, a sailor's valentine. My first entry was titled Chocolate Wave. It was a 10 inch valentine placed right next to a grand valentine by David Rhine at a Sarasota shell show. It was easy to see there was much more for me to learn. Other than knowing the basics, clamshells, conks, and scallops, I was referring to tiny shells as bits of food, such as sweet corn peas, rice, M&Ms, macaroni, or lemon drops. I forged on with the help of shell shows, club meetings, and using the internet for research. It's turning into a never-ending adventure of constant learning. The Chocolate Wave is still one of my favorite Valentines. There is no right or wrong place to start. Just step in and go for it. This traditionally styled Valentine is titled Ocean Rainbows. It dictates the use of techniques used in the 1800s. Barbados is the home for these souvenir Valentines, which were purchased by sailors upon their return trips home. Traditional Valentines use simple geometric patterns with paper dividers and cotton filler, all in an octagon frame. The divided sections were then filled with locally collected shells. The center section most often contained a harder rose. My piece included all natural shells, but they did not all come from the Caribbean, so it is referred to as created in the traditional style. For those fortunate to walk the beaches and pick up all kinds of odd treasures, this is the Valentine for you. I used all types of bits and pieces. To create art using all self-collected items is an adventurous undertaking, but will easily create a one-of-a-kind treasure. If fossil collecting is your thing, this is for you. It's created from a collection of undocumented tiny fossils where I used everything from baby shark's teeth to at least 21 fossils I could identify with still more needing to be named. I believe this is a better way to display a collection rather than hiding them in closet shoe boxes, in my humble opinion. Valentines do not always include shell flowers, but floral patterns are definitely a favorite today. For centuries, the Europeans created shell floral arrangements placed in octagon frames or under domed glass cloches. To create a show-stopping valentine today, a single basket of flowers or a design with a thousand tiny flowers will always be a winner. Even though the flowers are beautiful, it's always nice to add a bit of life to any design. Here I added a little ladybug made from a crab eye. I remember asking Bill Jordan if crab eyes actually came from live crabs. He was always very patient with me and yet a mentor to many of us. His encouragement to continue this art form and keep it alive for future generations was relentless. Please remember to always sign your work. It's important. There are many ways to do this. My work is signed with brass plates. I know one artist that hides a tiny seahorse somewhere in all her designs. Just remember, sign your work. The history of specimen collecting and use of shells in art is truly endless. Thankfully, today the internet connects us all to this world of information. These are my favorite books regarding Sailor's Valentine art. Now begins the fun, gathering shells to fit a theme. 
whether shells are bought from a specimen dealer, a shell show vendor, souvenir shop, traded with friends, or bought off the internet. They all need to be cleaned, sorted, and sized. This is time consuming, but time very well spent. That's just the way it is. Clean, sort, size, again and again. Sometimes I am lucky enough to purchase a treasured collection of dyed shells and patterns originally of the 1940s at an estate sale. My shell room is always in a state of constant chaos. Hundreds of recycled jars, the 60 drawer filing cabinet, lazy Susans, and shelf after shelf stacked with totes. Tools, tools, tools. Here are some of my favorites, but I have many more. My workspace is wherever I land, the kitchen or dining room table, the utility room, or outside on the deck. Shell art is basically everywhere. I start by choosing a gorgeous frame. All artists have their favorites. I prefer top-loading frames with generous inside working spaces. Frames of many beautiful woods are available. The eight-sided octagon frame is the typical frame used for Valentine's. However, other shapes have been used throughout history, even 12-sided frames. All frames need glass fronts to protect the delicate shell work. So much time is spent to create a beautiful Valentine that a strong frame is just as important as the work inside. Next, I would find inspiration for a design. This is a drawing by Ernst Haeckel of a basket star. My research then revealed there to be over 2,000 different varieties of sea stars to choose from. I may start by designing on paper, but as the process continues, that design is always adjusted over and over. Measuring, remeasuring, checking perspective, color choices, and even collecting comments from family members. It's all included in the process known as changing with the flow of happy accidents. Of course, the center of my Valentine would be a basket sea star. I chose contrasting colors for the background to highlight the star. It included mussels, sea glass, blue coral beads, apple blossoms, and thousands of tiny mussel pears standing on end. I chose slice shells for the tips of the arms. I fattened the wire arms with clay and eventually covered the arms with crushed pink shells. Once the background was fixed to the frame, I started adding as many sea stars as I could. Stars on top of stars, twinkling stars, feather sea stars, and brittle sea stars to name just a few. And even stars went up the sides of the frame. Here again is a drawing by Ernst Haeckel, and this was my interpretation. The basket sea star was resting atop a sea urchin to add that 3D effect. I've entered shell shows, and sometimes I do well. Sometimes my valentines miss the approval of judges. But for me, it's truly the opportunity to share ideas, meet with friends, and enjoy the many different projects created. Everyone has an artistic point of view. I am very pleased to have been awarded two People's Choice Awards so far. In honor of Bill Jordan, I do share and help answer questions as best I can. I teach Sailor's Valentine classes in Nantucket for the Nantucket Historical Association, and I also hold classes sponsored by the Sarasota Shell Club Artisans Group. I have taught youth classes where I might add they work very fast and have great imaginations. This class of nine plus one assistant finished nine Valentines in three hours. My granddaughter at the age of four also wanted to get in on the act. So by the age five, she had entered and received first place ribbons at the Philadelphia, Sarasota, and Sanibel Shell Shows. Today I'm working on an 18 inch Valentine. Valentines this size take oftentimes months to finish, but the workspace is still always the same. Lots of glasses, good lighting, and many tools to choose from. I have chosen to start with a beautiful frame that has ships engraved 
on each of the eight sides. The theme of this Valentine will be using traditional elements as well as combining it with a contemporary twist. I use a Lazy Susan to rotate my piece as I work on it. It gives me the opportunity to check my work from every angle. The blue tape marks the top of my Valentine case. Most of the center has been fixed into the case along with the shell divided sections. As you can see, most of the other shells are loose at this point. It's because I'm working on color choices today. I usually stick to three colors. There are artists who create Valentines using every color in the rainbow, but I choose to stick within the three. The traditional elements include a rose, a heart, an anchor, and the surrounding circle will reflect a compass, north, south, east, and west. And as always, I like to add a critter to my work, so I have created a Kraken. This octopus is commonly known as a Wonder Puss. It's a reminder of all the sailor stories encountering giant creatures. The coloring is created with sand and I still need to attach a few more suckers but it will fit into my piece just about like this. Then of course you have to add the flowers and all the little extra bling. It's in my opinion that anything from the sea can be used in a valentine, whether it's sand, pearls, shell beads, or dried critters. Some artists insist only natural shells can be used, but history tells us that there is a whole category of shell work that includes found objects, such as postcards, photographs, and dried critters. Dyed shells are also popular today. This technique of brightly colored shells began during the 1940s with the construction of shell jewelry. And then there are those who like to go one step further and add a little bling like rhinestones. Whatever makes you happy is truly the way to go. I've enjoyed spending this time with you, and I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Sanibel crew for creating their first virtual shell show. For me, it's time to call it a day and head outside for a nature walk.
We're here at Florida Shell and Dirt Company. My name is Roger Portell. I'm the director of invertebrate paleontology and micropaleontology collections at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, Florida. And this is Carmi Thompson. Carmi is a graduate student. But what we're trying to do at this pit is capture a stratigraphic section. So we're about to start sampling for our field work today. Here you can see members okay, so, of our field uh, crew. Toby Grun and I will start taking samples. This current section is over 300 centimeters. Take a little bit of time, especially if the material is hard or more rock-like. But generally, these shelly units are relatively unconsolidated or loose. The section was cleaned yesterday, so you can hopefully tell in this video that where they're collecting from is relatively homogeneous in coloration compared to the surrounding area. And you can see they're documenting again these different parts of the section in more detail up close. They'll begin sampling in the area around it to get some of these first shells for our section today. This is a close-up view of some of the outcrop that we've sectioned for our sampling today. You can see these pink flags, each are indicating a 30 centimeter interval. 30 centimeters is a fairly standard sampling interval for units of this nature, ones that are unlithified, often full of paleontological material. Finer sampling intervals can be useful for micropaleontology. Micropaleontology includes the study of organisms such as foraminifera, which are single-celled protists, and ostracodes, which are a type of arthropod. The technical term that I like to use is shrimp inside a peanut shell. And while these animals are not visible, if you were to take some of these sediments home with you and view them under a microscope, you may be able to see an environment that is teeming with forms of protists, single-celled organisms, and animal life, ostracodes. So in addition to collecting our stratigraphic samples, which are carefully measured, we're also taking bulk samples of some of the matrix. This sample is going to be going to a university in Ohio so that they can look at the shells and look for epibionts on the shells. So things like bryozoans, barnacles, anything that might grow on the animals when they were alive or after they've died, but before they get buried. At this quarry, the material that they sell is primarily shell and sand, and the shells are used primarily for road base, and they also sell the sand component, and they can use some of the shell as aggregate, mix it with sand, and add cement to make concrete. But sometimes if the shell component is pure enough, the shells are ground up, and they use them for chicken feed, and it helps with the production of eggs. Hi, this is Diane Scrimenti. I'm part of the Sanibel Captiver Shell Club, and I had the wonderful opportunity today to volunteer with Florida Museum and collect some shells. So we spent the day measuring out and collecting specimens and placing them in bags to be sorted later. I found a giant whelk. I originally came to help, but also found the opportunity to bring home a bucket full of uh, fossilized shells and I hope that everybody has as much fun as I did. So something cool about the vase shell, this is an index fossil for one of the units that we're looking at today. So an index fossil is a particular kind of fossil that can tell us about what time we're in. So this species of vase tells you that you're in the Burmont Formation. And the Burmont Formation is a Pleistocene unit that's found in different parts of Southern Florida. So that's a pretty exciting find because it tells us a little bit more about the geologic context of the site that we are visiting today. Hi, my name is Sabine Pratch, and I live on Sanibel. I hooked up with this dig through the Sanibel Shell Club, and I'm 
really grateful to the University of Florida to let me tag along and trip over some big shells. Um, I didn't find anything rare today, but I'm just super excited because this is my first time hunting fossils in Florida. Well, I've got a giant, uh, is it a lightning rock? Of course not. And then this one on the bottom is an extinct variety of a conch, and I'm really excited to find this because I've never seen anything like this. Well, this has just been like my happiest day ever. I know that probably sounds silly, but like I feel like I died and went to heaven, so thank you. We're now doing a little bit of a walking tour, but these are large spoil piles that remain when the construction companies running these mines are done with the material. They dump them into these big piles. All of these shells lying around the ground are excellent finds, and they can tell us a lot about these past environments in which these animals lived. However, they are not as useful as samples that are measured stratigraphically or in order. They're what paleontologists will often refer to as ex situ samples or out of place. Take a look, for example, at this mercenaria or giant clam that's ex situ. Mercenaria is a useful bivalve for paleontologists as it can be cut into thin layers and the bands of the shell, the dark and light bands, can be examined to study seasonality. The rings of shells can tell us a lot about what these past seasons might have looked like. This is another view of the Florida shell and fill quarry, showing some of the walls that we sampled earlier today. Something that our paleontologists discussed were stratigraphic sections. Stratigraphic sections are when you measure geologic units very carefully and precisely to capture the different intervals of time found within. In the background, you can hear some of the equipment that's been used to actively mine the quarry. As this is an active dig site, we have to be careful and wear hard hats and safety vests the entire time while we are in this quarry. Some footage of our field crew at the end of the day. We're taking several of our volunteers back up to the top of the quarry since there is some active mining equipment. Let's see some of the other ways in which we prepare fossils to go into a museum collection. When we bring samples in from the field, uh, usually they're dirty and we need to, to wash them off. We have a screen washing room here at the Florida Museum of Natural History. What we do is run the sediment samples through three different screen sizes. We have a hardware cloth, a window screen, and a brass screen. And so we want to collect um, all of the specimens that we can from those sediments that we collect. And the sediments that I'm washing today are part of Carmi Thompson's master's thesis. Uh, so we're just washing them down, and then once we wash them thoroughly, with, just with regular water, um, we'll stick them in our dryers. And um, we just use bathroom fans to allow uh, the moisture to be pulled away from the samples, and the specimens dry in a few days. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, um, watching the video of us in the field, and a little bit of uh, the screen washing room. And I hope that you'll join us uh, for the collection tour video by Invertebrate Paleontology and Invertebrate Zoology. And I want to thank the Sanibel Captiva Shell Club and Carmi Thompson uh, for production of this video. Thank you. Thompson, and I'm an invertebrate paleontologist, which means that I study shells that died a long time ago. This part of the museum is different from our public-facing side, which some of you may be familiar with. And welcome to the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection. The invertebrate fossils that we find come in all different forms. Sometimes we have body fossils, sometimes they're silicified, sometimes they're molded. And so what I'm doing is we've taken the moldic fossils and we pour a an RTV silicone rubber into the void. Once it sets up, we can peel it out and see what the fossil looked like. So here you can see a semi-cassis 
Once we have these positives, we can identify them much, much easier. Well, currently we have um, about 7 million specimens from around the world. The collection is primarily 65 million years old or younger. Primarily our interest and the research that we do here is, is the last 65 million years. About 75% uh, of the, the specimens in those collections are mollusks. So the type collection, the most important specimens in our collection, holotype is the specimen on which a new species is based. Stratigraphic collections are used by folks that are interested in knowing the superposition of, of the shells. The teaching collections for teaching classes, one such class was ancient environments, also invertebrate paleontology. We also send out quite a bit of material to other museums for their education program. We have lots of research questions that we're asking, predations, diversity, and so we're constantly providing specimens and information to researchers around the world. I actually got to start collecting fossils when, when I was uh, a youngster in Okinawa, Japan, and I started collecting and uh, haven't haven't stopped. Uh, but we, we do a lot of field work. Uh, currently, we're working uh, sites in Cuba, uh, the Bahamas, Antigua, Jamaica, uh, Dominican Republic. So th that's where our primary focus is. Uh, last year, we focused quite heavily on Po Plain of Italy uh, and some, some other localities in Europe. Cataloging process is basically after we've prepared and organized the, the fossil material, it needs to be cataloged with registration numbers put on it, entered into a database and numbered. I'll open up specimens of Scaphella or the volute, and especially Genonia. We have lots of them from the fossil record too here in Florida. We have quite an extensive collection of uh, this particular species, Scaphella floridana. Even as fossils, they still have their color pattern. Why don't we go and take a look at some of the larger specimens that we have on shelving units in the next aisle over. Wow, it's been great to see all these different kinds of shells. But this one, this one looks pretty chewed up. It has a lot of holes in it. Why does this happen? After these animals die, their skeletal remains are on the bottom of the ocean and they get growths on them like sponges. And this one, all these holes are caused by sulfur sponges. And so those sulfur sponges dissolve the calcium carbonate on the shell. Another shell, speaking of predation, are these cassis shells, also called helmet shells. The interesting thing about cassid shells is they primarily predate or bore into sea urchins and sea biscuits and sand dollars. And here at the Florida Museum of Natural History, we have several people that are studying uh, predation by helmet shells on echinoids through time. These are actually snails. These are marine snails of the family Turtelidae. The genus is called Vermicularia. Mm. And these are from the Pliocene, from shell pits down in Sarasota and Manatee County. What's really interesting about these are that these are a colonial type of habit for these gastropods. And that's something that you don't see very often in the modern or the fossil record. You probably won't see these large segments like this coiled uh, but you might find small, smaller pieces. You probably find them on the beaches mm -hmm. around Florida. And, but we don't see these big structures like we did in the Pliocene and Pleistocene, where they stretch for, for hundreds of yards. Uh, Carmi, I know this is one of your favorite shells. These are Achuria alabamensis, and they actually don't have a shell left. They're, you're looking at the internal and external walls. Now, cephalopods, if you think about them living today, are mostly seen as squids and octopods, but these are closest in relation to the nautilus, and some of you may collect nautilus shells, um, but cephalopods are a little less common in general in the fossil record. Right now, we're looking at some of the chambers of that animal, and those chambers are where, using a very small tube, they can regulate the position of their body in the water column when they were alive. Some of these specimens are from here in Florida, but we can also find them around other places like Georgia and Alabama. And that is an example of the tube that allows different amounts of water and air to enter the chambers and allows the animal to move through the water column. And these Achuria lived here in Florida about 35 to 40 million years ago. So these are truly ancient cephalopods.
We'd like to thank all of you at the Santa Bo Capti Michelle Club for coming along with us on this virtual collection tour today.
Cold up here, snowy, icy, slushy. We're having a winter storm, windy, cold, and it's no fun. Let's join the throngs that head to Florida. Ah, that's better. Play in the warm water, stick our toes in the sand, check out the sunset for a green flash. But there aren't a whole lot of shells right now. A few, but I heard sometimes there are more. Where are they? Hmm. Maybe what we need is a storm with lots of wind. A storm is predicted with northwest wind. That's exactly what we want. Why, you ask? Won't any wind do? Take a look at this display at the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum on Sanibel. The northwest wind blows across the top of Gulf waters and creates an undertow that heads back to shore. So a big strong wind means a lot of empty shells and live mollusks are dislodged and tossed toward the beach. It's even better if it blows at high tide, brings in a lot more shells and creates piles that could be several feet deep. And you never know what you're gonna find. Every storm is different and brings in different shells to each part of the island. It's been blowing all day, so let's get ready to shell. We want to go at low tide. Oh, the next low tide is at 4.17 a.m. But we wanna be in the beach before low tide, so we'll catch up on our sleep later tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be windy and cold, so here's the standard storm sheller outfit. First, water socks, which will go into water boots, long warm underwear, lined pants, wind pants, a turtleneck, a sweater, maybe another sweater, and a rain jacket, a hat, a hood, a scarf, water gloves, the biggest flashlight you can carry for several hours, and bags or a bucket to hold your finds. One hint, go to the bathroom before you get dressed. I guess lots of other people had the same idea. Look at all those flashlights. It's a big beach, so let's head this direction. Wow, there's a pygmy octopus about five inches long. Octopuses are mollusks that over the millennia have shed their protective shell. Look closely, she's laying eggs. And there's another octopus over here hitching a ride on a horse conch. The beach is alive with sea life, so we'll tread carefully so we don't step on any live animals. Here's a horse conch posing for our camera. This one is closing its operculum so it can stay warm and wet. Notice the brown coating on the shell. That's his protective periostracum. Shell collectors take it off to reveal the beautiful shell underneath. Naturalists always leave it on. 
These horse conchs have been tossed violently ashore along with their prey. The horse conch is the Florida state shell and can grow to be two feet long. It's an apex predator on the Florida beaches where it dines on other mollusks. The animal is a stunning orange color. And here's another horse conch with slipper shells all over it and surrounded by a variety of other shells. I'm gonna to try to identify them all and you do that too. Take a moment. Okay, let's compare notes. Gray sea star, horse mussel, Atlantic fixed snail, Florida prickly cockle, transverse arc, giant Atlantic cockle, banded tulip, Atlantic slipper snails, the horse conch, fighting conchs, and a pen shell. Did you get them all? Moving on down the beach, it looks like fighting conch city. These conchs are common and come in an array of patterns and colors from honey to deep purple. Will they be okay out of the water? We won't worry because I think the next tide will catch most of them and they are adapted to short periods out of the water. Now this one was stranded way high up on the beach in the sand, so we dug him out. See his eyes here at the end of his eye stalks looking at you? And here's his snout. He's a vegetarian that scrapes algae off rocks. We'll put him gently back in the water. No throwing ever. We know that live shelling is prohibited, so we're checking inside the shells. If we carry off a live shell, we know we'll know it soon because some aroma will begin to fill our bag. There might even be hermit crabs that have taken up residence in empty shells like these, and they are protected too. This crown conch definitely goes back in the water. What made this weird track in the sand? It's a nine-armed sea star trying to get back to the water. Let's give him an assist and set him carefully back at the shore. Now, egg cases frequently lose their attachment and float in after storms. This one is from a lightning whelk. Each capsule contains many baby shells that can grow to be as much as six inches long. Females are way larger than males. It takes a lot of energy to lay those egg cases. Now, this stunning lightning whelk shell is probably a smaller male. The sea life that shows up after a storm goes well beyond our treasured shells. And this speckled crab is wearing a hat. Not really. That's a crab barnacle that decided to take up resonance on the crab's carapace. These barnacles have shells, but they're not mollusks. They're crustaceans like the crab. What's this weird thing? It's called a mermaid's purse, but mermaids are seldom found on Sanibel's beaches. Actually, it's a skate egg case, and the skate will hatch fully formed. Look at this beach. It must be where the bivalves live. We've got some Atlantic cockles, pen shells, and the very elegant docinia. It's time to rest for a bit, and just in time, piles of shells appear. Shell piles move every year, but they tend to be larger off Middle and West Gulf Drive and near Blind Pass. Here's a lettered olive and a fly speck sereth. They're perched on top of a pile of bivalves with some kitten paws in them. A bright orange baby horse conch with its white nose. Actually, that's called a protoconch. Some alphabet cones, banded tulips, another alphabet cone with a rare stripe pattern. And it looks like we found some greenbacks as well as some vivid true tulips, gaudy nauticas, and scallops. And don't forget to look in the seaweed. Here, a beautiful coquina is trapped in the fronds. Big storms should bring in more rare shells, and they do. Genonias aren't really rare, but they live in very deep water, so it takes a long time for them to roll across the bottom of the gulf and up onto the shore. If you see brown spots on the edge of a shell buried in the sand, go ahead, dig it out. Oh, it's just a teaser, but save it for good luck. Here comes the tide. And long before we're ready to stop shelling, the water begins to cover the live animals and shells. It's time to go home, clean our treasures, and wait for the next storm to bring treasures from the Gulf to the shore.
Hi, I'm John Slapsinski, Collection Manager of Florida Museum of Natural History. We're going to tour the recent invertebrate collection here at the museum. The collection has roughly 550,000 lots of mollusks. So the collection is divided up into fluid preserved collections and dry collections which would just be dry shells. So the dry collections have information available in a database on our website. So this little beauty is a predator on anemones. So drill a hole into the anemone and suck on the fluid in the anemone. You all probably know Ganthenas. When you have winter storms that blow in, you get these beautiful purple snails. And what they'll do is they'll make a raft of bubbles of slime and they'll float around and they'll hunt things like man of war jellyfish, really nasty things. And they'll float around till they get a man of war and then they'll eat it. And they've got this just gorgeous counter coloration. So as these are floating around in the water column, from the top, the birds see dark water. From the bottom, fish see light air. So that counter coloration keeps them hidden from their predators. So squids are the only mollusks that have a closed circulatory system. So that means they can pump their blood rapidly, which also means they're really quick, aggressive, fast predators. And they run around and use these long tentacles to grab fish. And then once they grab the fish, They've got a beak, almost like a parrot beak, which they use to take big chunks out of the fish, and then they'll swallow those. Their suckers have little hooks on them. They're almost toothed on the edges, which allows them to grab slimy fish and hang on to them. And these are just really wonderful predators. And because of upwelling events, they'll gently get washed ashore. The giant squid that we found was still the chromatophores, there are pigment cells in the skin, and in some cases, these animals are still firing their chromatophores, still showing their pigment. We had an octopus that lived in our fish tank upstairs that would hold itself over the stairwell and turn bright red when somebody would walk by. Florida used to have a really good shrimp fishery, and boats would go out, and they would bring up some deeper water animals, including things like these Junonia and used to dump them kind of in a, a dump of bycatch. Here's another Scaphella species. Scaphella is the genus of Junonia. And this is a deeper water animal common off of Louisiana and off of the northern Gulf Coast. I can show you another one that was also really a common bycatch from those deeper water fisheries. This is Conus delicertii, and these are really common in deeper waters off of Florida. But we don't get to see them very often because we can only access the shallow water. We not only have marine animals, there are lots of terrestrial snails including this magnificent species from Madagascar. There are lots and lots of undescribed species. And the problem is there are very few people who study invertebrates of any kind. And so there aren't enough people for the amount of diversity. So if you think about animals, 99% of them are invertebrates. And it's a mishmash of lots of unrelated things. This is the uh, giant Atlantic cardiad. You know, it's a huge species, pretty common, nice to find. But there are some really cool cardiads that do unusual things. Here's one from the Pacific called Corculum. So why do you think it has this really bizarre shape? What these guys do is they have blue-green algae in their tissues, in their mantle. There are little clear spots in the shell that act like windows that allow light to come down. And the shell is flattened so that it has a large flat surface area to face towards the sun. And the little windows let the light in. And that gives the algae light to make energy, which the clam also uses. What these clams do is they'll sit nestled in coral with the shell gaping wide open and the tissues that are exposed have the blue-green algae that make energy for them. So they're able to inhabit coral reef areas that have almost no energy, almost nothing floating around the water. They're crystal clear water, but they're getting enough energy supplements from the algae to be able to live in those environments. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tour of invertebrates at Florida Museum. And I hope someday that we can see each other in person after the restrictions are over.
This has to be one of the strangest things that I've ever found on the beach after a storm. It is a gulf fireworm, a member of the bristleworm family. If you happen to touch one, you'll know exactly why it's called a fireworm. Do you see those bristles along its side and under its body? These bristles are their defense mechanism. They are venomous and are capable of delivering a very painful sting. They break off in your skin and release a toxin. The pain and itching can last for days. 
When fire worms feel threatened, they will roll into a ball and expose these venomous bristles. This species is also known as the common fire worm and the iridescent fire worm. They feed on algae, carrion, coral polyps, and decaying plants and animals. If you see one on the beach, be careful. Sometimes you can search for days and never see a sand dollar. And then other times they're everywhere. If you're lucky, you can see the trail they make when they're traveling across the sand. Remember, if you find them and they're covered with a skin of velvet textured spines, they are alive and cannot be taken from the beach. When they are dead and the skin is absent, they are white. Atlantic sea cucumbers are not edible. These little animals grow to be about a foot long and are related to sea stars and sea urchins. Like those creatures, they don't have a backbone, a heart, eyes, or a brain. Sea cucumbers don't have arms either, but they do have tube feet. They use these tube feet for walking or for anchoring to the sea bottom. They use the retractable tentacles around their mouth to sweep through the mud or to grab plankton to eat. Horseshoe crabs have existed nearly unchanged for the last 445 million years, and they're nearly identical to their ancient relatives. They're not crabs, and they're more closely related to spiders than anything else. There are four species of horseshoe crabs still around today. Only one species is found in North America. The other three species are found in Southeast Asia. This large hermit crab caught my eye because of its size, but I was really puzzled when I saw this other one scurrying across the tide pool floor. I simply couldn't figure out what kind of a shell he was using for his home. A closer look gave me the answer. It was a lightning whelk, and it was almost covered with other living creatures. There were two sea anemones, barnacles, a slipper shell, and what appears to be a gulf oyster drill and a rib cantharis. This curious collection turned into a thing of beauty when the sea anemone opened. It is as beautiful as the flower it's named for. There is something magical about seeing a live sea star. Most sea stars glide along the tidal pool floor on tube feet. It is hard to see the individual tube feet under this sea star's arm, but it shows how smoothly the animal moves. The action of these tube feet can be seen better here. Tube feet are arranged in grooves along the arms. They operate through hydraulic pressure. They're also used to pass food to the oral mouth at the center of the body and to attach the sea star to surfaces. This interesting little sea star is called a brittle star or a serpent star. It doesn't glide on tube feet like the other sea stars. Instead, it lifts its legs, moves them forward, and then places them down again. If I gently place it on my hand, we can get a better look at how agile it is. When I put it back into the water, it will continue on its journey. Did you know that if one or more arms and a portion of the central body break off, both pieces of the brittle star will grow new bodies and arms to form two animals. If you've walked on a sandbar or a mud flat during a low tide, more than likely you've seen these squiggly piles and maybe wondered what made them. Well, we call them castings, but simply put, they're the poo of lugworms. Lugworms live in a U-shaped burrow in the sand. Often you will see a hole or an indentation in the sand off to the side of the casting. That is their feeding pit. It eats sediment from the front of its burrow and expels a cast from its tail. You have probably seen hundreds of these U-shaped things on the beach after a storm. They are parchment worm casings. The worm lives in this parchment-like U-shaped tube. The tube is under the sand with both ends exposed to the water. 
The worm feeds by pumping water through its tube, trapping plankton and other suspended organic matter on a net of mucus. This worm has a unique way of protecting itself from predators. If the tube opening is disturbed, the worm releases a blue luminous cloud of mucus and then it retreats to the opposite end of the tube. These strange looking blobs are known as sea pork. The name refers to various species of tunicates that have been siphoning, filtering, and squirting water for hundreds of millions of years. They are composed of colonies of organisms called zoids. They live nestled together in a protective sheath. They are found in various colors. Newcomers to the beach often think that the black ones are globs of oil from an oil spill. The name is said to come from the fact that dead tunicates sometimes resemble slabs of glistening fat. Marine worms create gelatinous bubbles and blobs that hold their eggs. One day I stumbled upon a worm creating one. At first the gelatinous bubble was relatively small, then little by little it enlarged. When it was an adequate size, the worm inhaled the fluid, and when it exhaled, eggs were pushed into the gelatinous mass. This breathing-like action continued until the fluid was filled with eggs. I wanted to combine a lot of my hobbies into one big project. I like to make settlers' valentines, I love to shell, I like mermaids, I like dollhouses, and I had a vision of doing a dollhouse that had a beach scene around it. It's a never-ending project. I'm always adding things to it, making different things for it, and if you'd like to come see it in person, or talk about miniatures, come by and see me. So I started by buying a kit. I started with the beach scene. One of the first things I did was make the fishing floats. I took old marbles and I took old shelling bags and some cord and kind of wrapped them up and hung them along the porch. I have some old fishing net that I use to kind of lay around and I added baskets of shells. And my favorite seashell is a Wendell trap, so I had to do a wagon of Wendell traps. You'll see a lot of Wendell traps in the dollhouse. I decided to make a miniature shell craft room. I created a wall of micro and mini shells. I got miniature glass bottles with corks and used a lot of my Sailor Valentine shells or my self-collected sea urchin spines and filled probably about 100 jars up with different little minis that I had. And I even made some one inch Sailor's Valentines. Then I moved on to the bedroom where I created a coquina mirror. There is a shell lamp in there. Then I decided I would do a mermaid themed bathroom. You can see I have a mermaid sitting on the tub and she's embellished with some seashells. Then I went down to the living room and I had some mini printers boxes that I used more of my self-collected minis from Sanibel that I used to fill the printers boxes and make a Tiffany shell lamp that has little starfish on the outside. In the kitchen, I made some lace curtains that have some little miniature pygmy seahorses and seashells to keep with the seashell theme of the dollhouse. I had a lot of fun making it. My favorite room is definitely the shell crafting room.
I'm Tobias Grun. I'm a research associate at the University of Florida at the Florida Museum and I work here in the invertebrate paleontology. I came here about two years ago from uh, Germany. I did some research on echinoids, on sea urchins, mostly on um, irregular sea urchins and their predator prey interactions. Officially now a biologist and a geologist, so I think the balance between both fossil and modern is very important. I worked a long time, over 10 years now, with sea urchins, with irregular sea urchins, their ecology and evolution. I was actually on a family vacation um, in the Canary Island in Spain, walked around the beach. I found a lot of uh, shells and I was wondering what they are. So they looked like little snails, little snail shells. I was like, hmm, those look very interesting, I hope that is possible to see. And then didn't know what they are, so I just collected a few and looked at them in more detail. And I saw they have a siphonicolus, they have chambers inside, so that must be um, a cephalopod, because no shells have, um, so no molluscan shells other than these have um, these kind of chambers. I know from my paleontological um, education that this is only, so these coil, these uh, spiraled, um, shells are mostly known only from um, from the fossil record and from um, things like um, from other cephalopods like ammonites or so. And I thought it's uh, very unlikely that I found a living ammonite, so that cannot be the um, thing. And I looked more and more into literature and found that this is um, Spirula, so the uh, ram's horn squid. And this guy is um, is the only recent representative. Of in, within the cephalopods it has a coiled shell. It's very few details are known about these shells or about these animals in general um, even though they are so important in terms that they are the only representatives of um, coiled cephalopods today. These shells are used by the animal for buoyancy so they can get more gases in and get more buoyant, they go up or they release gases and go down. Uh, so when the animal decays these shells, these skeletons, um, go up and float on the surface in the water because they are still filled with air or with gas. And very often we find that um, some barnacles are going um, on top and encrust them. So they serve as kind of a um, mobile island in the water. They float around and um, they transport these um, barnacles um, around in the environment and help them to distribute. Got some um, CT scans, high resolution x-ray. Here, So we have a 3D rendering of the skeleton here. We see the chamber shell itself here and here the barnacles that sit on top. We see the opening that runs through the entire skeleton. We also have in the other windows um, slices of these that we can go through and we are able to go through the entire skeleton and see them from different sides. So we can calculate the internal volume of the gas and we can also do some uh, real fancy analysis where we look not only into um, the shell morphology but also the thickness. So this is a model of the shell that allows us to analyze uh, the thickness of um, various parts. If we understand how these uh, shells work, how the uh, morphology and structural integrity of the shells works in this animal, then we can go one step further, go into the fossil record and compare the fossil shells to modern shells. How did the shells changed within the last couple of million years, for example. That's a very exciting research and I'm very happy that the Shell Club is funding this research because it wouldn't be um, possible to do all this research without um, extensive funding. Because we got these nice um, 3D glasses is great for outreach and make these topics more attractive to especially also the young people. I already developed one of these educational games. We look around, there are different informational boxes uh, presented of the shelves and there are different rooms. You see now exactly what I'm seeing. Now I can, can now grab it, look around and see the different structures inside. It's 
really cool. Really, I can handle it like I was standing there. And now I can just walk around. Here's a poster that I did um, last year on a conference. Have a really detailed look at it make it much much more fancy. There's several different people, manufacturers that we have to thank for because they provide on the funding for free software, they provide good tools that we need on the funding for um, can be really acknowledged here for the Sunnyville Captiva Shell Club and also for our field work. So this is also designed as kind of a way to not only present scientific um, data to the public but we can make uh, also virtual conferences where participants, different players come into the game and they can stand out here, discuss or go to the poster presentations inside. So that's a very, very cool way to present data. I'm very happy that you are listening and that you are interested in the things that I'm doing. Again, special thanks to the Shell Club that made all these uh, here possible for me. And I hope that my research will have also the impact educating of people recruiting or make it more attractive for other people, for especially younger people, so that um, all the, the shell collecting and all the knowledge and uh, also all the fun will go into the next generation. Thanks again! When we are on a beach strewn with seashells, it's sometimes hard to believe that all of them were once part of a living animal. They were either part of a single-shelled animal called a gastropod or a bivalve that consists of two parts. When is the best time to see live shells on Sanibel? During a low tide. There are usually two low tides every day, one in the morning and one later in the day. The morning low tide is usually the lowest of the two. The lowest tides of the month are when there is a full moon or a new moon. The tide is very low on this December morning. It's just before daybreak and the reflection of the moon can be seen in the tide pool where this mother and daughter are looking for shells. The lowest tides of the year begin mid-November and continue through March. The person you see walking in the distance is walking on a sandbar at low tide. There is a good low tide this morning, so let's go to the beach and see what we can find. By the way, did you know that gastropods have some of the same organs like we do? And that includes eyes. If there was an award in the shelling world for being cute, this three inch Florida fighting conch certainly would be a contender. Its eyes are located at the end of tentacles. And, as seen here, when fighting conchs move from one place to another, each tentacle emerges from its own notch at the end of the shell. Like most mollusks, it has very limited vision. On the other hand, let's look at this seaweed-covered horse conch. It's about 14 inches long, much larger than the fighting conch, but its eyes are much smaller. The little black dot on the side of the tentacle is one of its eyes. A scallop's beautiful eyes may be a brilliant blue color. They allow the scallop to detect light, dark, and motion, but that's about it. This is an alphabet cone. We rarely get a chance to see their eyes, and you have to look closely to see the apple murex's eyes. They're at the base of the tentacles. Check out this handsome profile. It's an Atlantic fig snail, and its eyes appear to be on its head, not on its tentacles. Do you see the skin-like structure that extends into the tip of the shell? It's called the mantle. It's the organ that builds the shell, but it also has a second purpose. When it extends out the tip of the shell, it becomes tube-shaped, and it's called a siphon. The part of the shell by it is called the siphonal canal. Water is taken in through the siphon and into the mantle cavity, where it passes over the mollusk gills. They are the fringe-like structures seen here. 
This little mud snail looks like a dog trying to find a buried bone. Many gastropods have a sense organ inside the mantle cavity that acts much like the one that we have behind our nose. It detects chemical indicators in the water. This mud snail is probably following his siphon in search of food or maybe a mate. Scallops have two sets of gills, one on the top and one on the bottom. You can see where each set meets at the edge. Some gastropods are carnivores and hunt their prey. Others are herbivores and feast on seaweeds. Then there are the omnivores. They eat both plant and animal life. This Florida fighting conch appears to be looking for something to eat. The dark tubular structure you see is not its siphon, it's the fighting conch's proboscis. Fighting conchs have a short siphon. It is hidden inside the siphonal notch. The conch's mouth is at the end of the proboscis and inside the mouth is a ribbon-like structure with rows of sharp teeth. It's called the radula. This is a microscopic image of a radula. It shows its length and its ribbon-like structure with longitudinal rows of strong teeth. One day when I was walking on the beach, I found a dead pear whelk. When I looked at it closely, I saw something I'd never seen before. It was a row of teeth. There are many types of radulas. I have examples of two of them. The cowrie's radula is used like a scraper when it's eating. This abalone's tongue-like radula appears to be more complex than that of the cowrie. This apple murex is a carnivore and is seen feeding on a Florida fighting conch. It holds the conch with its muscular foot and then enjoys its meal. Mollusks in the murex family are capable of making holes in shells in order to get at the soft-bodied animal inside. They use their radula to rasp the shell away, leaving a perfectly round hole. This can take hours to accomplish. Holes and bivalves are commonly found near the hinge where the most delicate parts of the clam's body are located. This fighting conch is being attacked by a true tulip using the very same method of action. Lightning whelks can open large cockles and clams in order to eat them. This whelk is pulling a giant Atlantic cockle towards its shell. The whelk positions the cockle so the shell margin opposite the hinge will press against the sharp lip of its shell. The whelk applies pressure on the cockle, pushing it against the lip until it pops open as we can see here. Another apple murex is taking advantage of a lightning whelk whose meaty foot is exposed. The body of this horse conch is fully extended in order to reach this dead crab. Its face is buried in its food. It's hard to believe that big body will fit back into the shell. If you're wondering about that dark structure on the bodies of the lightning whelk and horse conch, it's called the operculum and it's one of the mollusk protection devices. When the mollusk feels threatened, it pulls back into its shell and the operculum becomes a shield against predators. This fighting conch looks like a little elephant with his proboscis in the air. He's a vegetarian, but he won't find any seaweed up there. You can see this crown conch siphon extending from the siphonal canal. Its proboscis can be seen below it. One day I found two of them feeding on a shark eye. You can see they've eaten through the shark eye's delicate operculum to get at its body. Most bivalves are filter feeders. They have two siphons, an inhalant siphon, seen here on the right, and an exhalant siphon on the left. If you watch closely, you can see how they work. This giant Atlantic cockle inhales, closes its inhalant siphon, and then exhales. Angel wings are beautiful bivalves that live buried deeply in the sand. This is what we refer to as an angel wing bed. Their two siphons are contained in one tubular structure. 
water is drawn in through one and expelled through the other. Microalgae and zooplankton are filtered out of the water as it passes through their gills. Cilia move the food particles to their mouth. Waste products are ejected in the form of pellets. These pellets are sometimes referred to as pseudo-feces. Whoops, I think that was an accident. You can see a collection of pseudo-feces around these angel wings. This apple murex had planned to eat this prickly cockle, but the cockle closed the two halves of its shell quickly, in fact, a bit too quickly, and caught his foot in the process. When this sunray Venus sensed the crown conch's proboscis inside the edge of its shell, it shut quickly and trapped the conch. I tried to pry the clam open. I even used a fingernail clipper, but I was unsuccessful. Horse conchs are the top predator in the Gulf of Mexico. I found this one devouring a lightning whelk. I continued my walk down the beach, and when I returned, all that was left of the lightning whelk was the empty shell and a bit of meat on the operculum. Welcome to dawn on Sanibel's Lighthouse Beach during a minus tide. There was a recent storm and we hope we can see some live mollusks or maybe find some mollusk egg cases this morning. Some of the marine snails found in the waters surrounding Sanibel are of separate sexes. Like in most gastropods, you cannot determine the sex of horse conchs by their size. We know this one is a male because his body is extended and his reproductive organ is visible. Mollusks come together to mate on the ocean floor and on the mud flats. Fertilization is sometimes internal. Females in some species, like the horse conchs, produce eggs in egg cases and attach them to something solid in the water. These horse conch egg cases have been attached to a broken piece of coral. Egg cases vary in size and shape from one species to another. Two adult males accompany this large female lightning whelk. The males in this species are relatively smaller than the females. Soon after mating, the female will begin to lay a string of capsules containing eggs. If you look closely, you will see a banded tulip is attaching her egg cases on those of the lightning whelk. There can be 30 to 100 eggs in each capsule, but only 8 to 13 will hatch. Young lightning whelks will be fully developed between 45 and 60 days after the eggs are laid. Though they are very small, they look just like the adults. There can be up to 145 capsules in a lightning whelk string. So that means that 4,000 to 14,000 young lightning whelks could hatch from this string of capsules. A true tulip grows to be much larger than a banded tulip. This is a true tulip egg case. Evidently, the strong winds loosened it from the golf floor and it washed ashore. It looks like the young mollusks inside the capsule are almost fully developed. When they are fully developed, they will break through this delicate membrane on the top of the capsule and go out into the water. This open hole indicates the young whelks have left the capsule. These young tulips did not survive and were found inside one of the capsules. Shark eyes lay their eggs in a sand collar. With her foot covering her shell, she uses mucus from her foot and sand to create a base. She disperses her eggs throughout the collar and then adds another layer of sand and mucus. Basically, it's a sandwich with the eggs between two layers of sand and mucus. Female apple murex snails participate in what's referred to as communal egg laying. Numerous females simultaneously lay clutches of egg capsules in one single large mass. Banded tulips are much smaller than true tulips, and their egg cases are similar but also smaller. True tulip eggs are red, but banded tulip eggs are cream colored.
Here are some of the ways mollusks get from one place to another.
My name is Chris Davison. I am the general manager of the Island Inn. The Island Inn actually hosted the first ever Shell Show. It started, I believe, as somewhat of a community fair, and then shells and the shell displays became the obvious attraction at some point and then it just grew and transitioned from there. Shelling is still very important to the Island Inn. We have folks that travel from all over the world just to come to Sanibel, just to come to the Island Inn and to go shelling. Sometimes it's their dream of a lifetime and you know they've been saving 20 years to make this trip and others, they come every year at the same time to kind of get their shelling fix. We have shell displays at the Island Inn Absolutely beautiful displays, actually. Shells that were donated by a guest. We worked with the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum to set up displays and make sure that they were named, scientific names. We actually have some pictures of the shell fair. The shell show is definitely important to the island as shells and shelling are, are important to the island. I think it's a gateway to education, appreciation of the greater environment here on Sanibel Island. But you can use that shell to make the next step to get folks to really care about not only the shell, but the animal in the shell, the environment which that animal came from. I think it plays a huge role in Sanibel Island, both historically and today. My name is Deb McQuaid Gleason and we came here in 1957 and we were on a scouting mission because my father was tired of cold winters in Baltimore Harbor where he worked. We bought five acres of land. I was seven and of course that's the perfect age for being a sheller and there really wasn't anything to do on the island except ride your bike and go shelling. Back then, it, there wasn't a law against live shelling, so we could be ruthless. It kind of kind of got to be old hat after a while. You know, you can only boil so many shells. We went to the old schoolhouse on, on Periwinkle, and the teacher there, she was very good when you consider that she was teaching grades one through six. There wasn't science class. Your science class was shells. Everybody had a collection to put into the shell fair every year. It was the big event took the day off from school, everybody went, and everybody was very proud of their exhibit, whether they won a ribbon or not. I was boring, I didn't specialize in anything. I would just put out my best shells. I finally realized that you had to put the Latin names to get any attention whatsoever. Well, it used to be that was, that was the huge event of the year. That was like the county fair. That's what everybody looked forward to, besides just being shells. It was a display of artwork, handicraft, people's baked goods. I mean, it was it was really the community fair. It wasn't just shell fair. My recollection is that the shell fair was always at the community house. I think the shell fair is a wonderful thing. It's no longer quite the community event. I think it's more the world event now. I'm really proud of it and that it's that it's expanded and it's gotten so much recognition for its scientific endeavors. My name is Teresa Riska Hall and I have the unique pleasure of managing the community house as the executive director and that is um, run by the Sanibel Community Association. I came to the island in 1983 as a college student. Worked on the islands for a lot of years. I've been with the community house since November of 2011. So it was more of a country fair atmosphere. And so now over the years, we try to have elements of that. The Sanibel Captiva Shell Club was asked to take over the show in 1963. They needed somebody that would really take that as a priority and make that into the world renowned show that it is today. The Shell Club has really developed a scientific area and an artistic area that are bar none outstanding throughout the world. They come from all over the world, so it helps our economic development. It helps locally, businesses are busy, the people stay locally. Even the islanders that live here will still come out year after year to see those displays and to partake of the atmosphere of fun, community, the socialization that is so important. That's always been an important part of our mission is to make it a small town atmosphere and 
keep all of the groups working together because there are many groups that work at the house. I just would like to say that the community house is an important piece of the history and island life. The Shell Show is the most important piece to the community house and its annual fundraising so that we can keep the rents low for those groups that are coming in. Well, I'm Richard Johnson and this is my wife Meads. We are the third generation of uh, the operation of Bailey's General Store. The Bailey family originated in Kentucky and made the move down to the island back when the island was an agrarian society. So they started out as farmers. Meads' grandfather, Frank Bailey, and his two brothers and their mother came down and started that way. Between the three of them, they really weren't real good farmers, but they found that they had a knack for mercantile. And so back in 1899, Sanibel Packing Company was founded by Frank Bailey and his two brothers. And the packing company collected produce, watermelon. Green beans. Yeah, green tomatoes. beans. Or as the Bailey family says, tomatoes. Tomato, tomato, yes. Tomato, tomato. From what I understand, Granny Mead Matthews, who started the Island Inn, started the Shell Show. I think she started the very first one, and then it progressed from there into being a very big event for the Island. I did. I entered as many shows as we could as kids. I don't think I got any outstanding ribbons or anything. I want to say in my time, it was probably less scientific and more artistic. For us, it was a big deal. It was just, I think, as a child, it was a fun event for us. Shell collections were classified according to age and what grade you were in school. You know, I always thought I put together a really nice shell collection, and I, but I, like I said, I don't think I got any major ribbons there, but it was fun. And just having that goal of putting all of your shells together and presenting them in their shell box and typing up the little tags was a very big deal. Using a typewriter was just high tech at the time and so we, we were very proud of our shell displays. I think the people in the community value the history and heritage of where we came from. Today the Shell Festival harkens back to the days of old but just like everything else on the island while a lot of things have stayed the same some things have changed and evolved over the years. And what it's evolved to, I think, is a premier event held here at the Sanibel Community House. And there's two distinct communities that are involved in the Shell Festival. So you have the lovely grounds here, as well as the building. But on the outside, we have this age-old group called the Shell Crafters. Those folks literally meet here at the Community House once a week, and so they set up tents and booths on the outside of the the community house. They have artwork created with shells. Now let's change that just a little bit. Let's take a trip inside the community house. When someone comes to the inside, they're going to find that it's the shell club that's on the inside. And the shell club has their focus on two areas. One is artistic, but then there's also scientific applications and the scientific demonstrations and presentations that make up the shell club. While the shell crafters shell their wares and the net proceeds of that go to help support the community house because as we all know, we have a beautiful facility here in our community. Historic, we're sitting in the historic room that Frank Bailey was involved in helping to get started. We still have this historic value here, but we've also renewed the community house. The shell crafters are very generous with their time and effort, and all that money goes to the community house itself, the SCA. Whereas the shell club, on the other hand, takes a little bit different focus. They provide grants, educational opportunities for folks that are involved in the study of mollusks. It works out really well. Great balance here. the stories that we do tell at the museum, of course, is that um, shells have always been hugely important to Sanibel because our first inhabitants subsisted on them. They were great shellers, they ate conchs, they ate clams, they ate fish also, but that's how they made their homes. They raised up their homes on top of shell mounds, and so really shells have always been intimate to this island. My 
favorite shell would be the horse conch. When they're babies, when they're only like three quarters of an inch long, they're that bright orange with that little tiny white top. And then when they grow to be adults, they can be as large as two feet. So, I mean, they're just wonderful shells. But I, I am a shell collector. I still collect shells. I love to be on the beach. Shells are amazing. Mead's eyes are focused on the ground beneath their feet. For sure. Yes, I absolutely have a favorite shell, and that would be the orange pectin. I'm particularly into minis, any mini shell that I can find. I have not ever found a genonia. So, do you have a favorite shell? My favorite shell probably would be the shark eye. Love that shell, it's so beautiful. And my daughters love it too, and it's a, it's a good teaching tool, I think, as well. I mean, like, I love the Florida horse conch. I found a huge one, it's kind of a peachy orange color. I love the lightning whelk because it opens on the left-hand side. Usually the ones in my office are ones that have been given to me over the years from Shell Festival people. It's a fascinating pastime, and it's one that is um, addicting. Did you just get back from the beach with a bag of shells that look rather drab and have barnacles on them? Cleaning them is the first step to enhancing their beauty. Start by getting rid of any excess sand. For smaller shells, it means just rinsing them off. In order to get the sand out of larger shells, my husband made this device. The water pressure forces sand and shells from the inner parts of the shell. Some people use a water pick for smaller shells. Next add a 50% water and bleach solution or pure bleach to soak the shells overnight. It is easy to see what part of the shell was submerged in the bleach. I'll change the shell's position so the opposite side is submerged. This is the second shell. Whoops, watch those bare fingers. You really should have two gloves on. The exposed areas of the shells are cleaned, so I'll rinse them in fresh water.
Some barnacles come off all by themselves. Thin bladed knives and dental picks are the tools of a shell cleaner's trade. The bleach has become deteriorated and it's not been effective. It needs to be replaced. We'll try to remove the remaining barnacles. Sometimes this means shaving them off. Now I only need to submerge the necessary areas, so I'll use a smaller container. Hi, Claire Beckman back again as Cephalopoda Ceremonies. And a big thank you for staying with us today to watch the show. And I hope a lot of things. I hope that you commented on the videos. I hope that you won a door prize. I hope you liked the show so much that you went to our website, sanibelshellclub.com and click donate to help us with our grants program. And more than anything, I hope you learned something and had a lot of fun. Tomorrow, we hope that you'll come back and join us. Remember, tomorrow is a separate link for the show. So you need to get the link from social media or on our website at, you got it, sanibelshellclub.com. See you tomorrow, thanks.